John Golia. I'm Greg Fife. And I'm Todd Curtis. And we are the Flight Safety Detectives. Between us, we have over a century of aviation accident investigation and safety experience to draw on as we discuss issues that affect all of us. So we are qualified to share our perspectives on accidents and incidents and what can be learned from them for the future. We're proud to say that we have two sponsors that really relate to the topic of aviation safety. The Professional Aviation Maintenance Association, or PAMA, and Avemco Insurance. Later on in the show, we'll tell you how you can get a 5% discount on your insurance just for listening to the show. We don't just dissect the official reports. In every episode, we identify safety issues and take the mystery out of accident investigations. So maybe pilots in their planes can have safer flights ahead. Well, gentlemen, it is a continuation of a previous show because we were having just a good time. We finally got all of us together. So we decided, you know what? Let's record another show. So you'll see that we're all wearing the same thing. We didn't go anywhere. We look a little tired. Had a few cocktails. You know, now we're loosened up. So we're going to be talking about an accident involving a fixed wing aircraft that happened back in 1982. And the reason we're doing this show is because we received an email. Todd, what did that email tell us? Well, the uh, person, it was actually a YouTube comment to one of our, our, our videos on YouTube. And this person said, hey, you know, why don't you do an accident on this singer, Keith Green, who I'll, be, I'll admit, never heard of the person. Did a little internet search. He was a person who was big in the Christian music uh, scene. He died in a plane crash in 1982, 41 years ago. And I thought, all right, let's see what's out there. And fortunately, there was not only an NTSB report. I've seen at least a couple of tribute videos talking about the accident and the singer. And this was very insightful to us because between that information, the media reports, I was still able to pull up off the internet 42 years later, 41 years later. Uh, we have a show here, and I think we have a lot of good things to say about how accidents were done back then with respect to the NTSB, comparing to how it's done now, as well as the particulars of this flight, which, again, like many, I think was an avoidable on several levels and tragic as well. Well, you know, Greg, you, that, that's an interesting point, because while I was at the board, you know, and you were at the same time, you were longer than I was. Uh, this was normally the way we did it, and the findings always were a long and uh, sometimes tedious to listen to all these these findings because the board members, from my point of view, we'd already read all this stuff, and now we're reading it into the record, so we have to cover, you know, word for word all of it. But I wonder where it went. It changed. You know, I left in '04. Yeah, and I wonder, and on, you know, it changed because the big red easy button came. People got lazy. People got complacent. People didn't want to put the work into it. And the investigator who did this accident was a good friend of mine. And Warren was very thorough, very, I mean, just did a great job with accident investigation. And, and because this is the way we used to have to scribe our findings into the report, you see in the findings, and, and Todd's going to have this on our website, you'll see that the probable cause statement, yeah, it does start with the National Transportation Safety Board determines that. But rather than some rambling little, you know, statement of, well, lost control for unknown reasons or the B-nut came loose because of poor maintenance, you look at the findings in this particular accident and Warren laid all of the elements out. That and gives just for the record... Uh, this is Warren V. Wandell, who is the investigator you're, you're mentioning. Yeah. And and so that's the way we had to do it. You had to lay out all the cause and contributing factors. And when you read this litany of cause and contributing factors, there's no doubt what happened in this accident. 
and you got you now you have a place to go look if you really wanted to to see because you operated the same kind of airplane and maybe in a similar type of operation now you could go in and say what were the factors do we have those here at our operation which makes a big difference it makes the report meaningful yep and and this this accident involved a Cessna 414 twin engine airplane piston uh, aircraft um, it did have or was equipped with a Robertson Stoll kit, which gave it short field takeoff performance, which was great. Now, here's the problem. It only had seven seats, but when you have four adults and eight kids, that, that's problem number one. Problem number two was the pilot who was a former military pilot, apparently. He had, he got some, uh, he got his, uh, his civilian certificates. He, hold, he held a commercial pilot certificate with airplane single, multi-engine land and an instrument rating. But when you read the statement in the report, the caveat was that he had gotten his multi-engine rating in a centerline thrust aircraft. Now, if it was in the military, then that meant that there must have been two engines in parallel <laughs> down the middle of the aircraft. Or if he got it in civilian world, really the only airplane other that's very popular, I will say, is the Cessna 337. We call it the Mixmaster, but it was the Skymaster. And there was always a restriction that, yes, you had a multi-engine rating, but it was limited to centerline thrust. The note says that he spent two hours to get that restriction removed and turned it into a multi-engine rating. But again, you have to continue to read the report and Warren did a great job of adding additional information. And John, you read that information and that was that that two hours got rid of the restriction, but he never went to any kind of formal training on the 414. He had, he didn't even meet the insurance requirements for that particular aircraft. So now, now you get into the human factors, overconfidence and personal skills, abilities, and knowledge. When you look at all of the information that goes into this, four adults, eight kids, this guy was almost 500 pounds over the maximum gross weight of the airplane and almost five inches out of the FCG. Anybody in aviation who understands airplanes knows being 500 pounds over and almost five inches out of the FCG, you're begging trouble. That airplane, if you get it in the air, is not going anywhere. The first three findings, pre-flight planning, inadequate, weight and balance, not performed, all right? Weight and balance exceeded. They had separated those two. Performance yeah. data not understood. This airplane crashed on the airport. You know, how many times have we, we've talked about this before? I mean, here goes barreling down the runway. He used up 2,000 feet of asphalt and tried to fly the airplane. It rotated early. Well, yeah. maybe because that CG was so far aft. Uh, we've seen that. Yep, airplane auto rot started to auto rotate. And on top of this, the analysis says that in his military flying, he was a Marine pilot. Or any FAA exam or check rides, um, he had never been required to perform weight and balance computations. Now, if you've never been required, again, I, I'm, I'm like shaking my head. You know, I'm old enough to have been flying in that area, era, you know, 172s and 152s. I did weight and balance back then. How hard would it be to do a weight and balance calculation? Isn't that something that every pilot, no matter who they were, military, civilian, would have would have known about? Well, and uh, wouldn't they have the common sense to think, hey, I'm putting in more people than seats in the airplane. Maybe I should think this through. Just saying. Yeah. We've seen that before. That's the first thing that came to my mind when I saw that. When you sent that, that note from the, the uh, email and, and looked at this thing and said, how many passengers? But the big thing in, in this particular accident is it, you have to shake your head because where's the logic? Who in their right mind as an aviator, especially someone that was as structured and disciplined as a military aviator would just throw the rule book right out the window and go, oh yeah, let's just stuff all these people in this airplane, even if they can't sit in a seat and let's just kick the tires, light the fire and go. 
Well, he did that. He got the airplane flying, but he never got very high, 100 feet or so, and ended up stall mushing the airplane into the trees off the end of the runway. And uh, the majority of those people died of the post-crash fire. I'll bet you dollars to donuts you didn't give him a, a briefing, any kind of passenger briefing, which is required before every takeoff by every pilot. So again, I mean, the question is, you have a very prominent figure. Okay, is there self-induced pressure to make the trip happen because you have some high profile person or persons on the airplane? We've seen it over and over and over again. I mean, I, I went to, <laughs> I was fortunate that, uh, that I went to a concert, uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan had played in Denver. I went to the concert the night um, that he played, got to meet him backstage, did all of this stuff. He left the next day, went to Wisconsin and ended up dying 24 hours later because a guy in a helicopter who was moving him to the airport tried to fly him in fog and they hit the ground and killed a very famous person. Again, self-induced pressure, accomplished the mission. We saw that with the private pilot who had the big bopper and, and, and uh, Richie Valens and, and those guys. He's a private pilot trying to fly a Bonanza in a snowstorm, trying to accomplish the mission when they weren't necessarily qualified or equipped personally with the skills, abilities, and knowledge to be able to conduct that particular flight. And it's now you've got a guy like this trying to do the same thing. He mentioned you know, we, have mentioned. A, we have a long list that we plan on doing shows on for prominent people, entertainers, and others that have perished in plane crashes, charter flights, and uh, sometimes friends flying them. doesn't matter the mode. Uh, that We just have them on the queue to talk about them because there's a tremendous number of them. And, you know, we see in the, in the political market, you know, we got a presidential campaign coming up, and we'll have one-third of the Senate and all of the House of Representatives up, and in some of these locations, uh, the senators are all uh, chartering airplanes. In some of the, the bigger states, less populous states, even the, the congressmen will charter airplanes to fly around the state because distances are so great. And just because they go down to the local FBO and say, who's got an airplane for, for hire here and jumping into it without vetting them, it's crazy. Now, Greg, you and I have done a number of, of uh, vettings for high high net value people uh, to make sure that they get uh, companies that are going to provide them pilots and airplanes that are worth uh, chartering. Not every charter company is, is the same. We've, and, we've, uh, seen it, we've seen it with the Wellstone accident up in Minnesota. We've seen it with NCAA um, teams that an alumni says, yeah, I use my airplane and my pilot, and they end up getting killed. Oklahoma State is, is right. that accident, the Beach King Air. So, I mean, the question, I mean, there are so many human factors. And when you see a tragic accident like this, where eight kids were killed because of one human and their stupidity, and I can't call, I could call it a lot of other things. This is a family show, though. But it's stupidity to even think that one, you don't have the experience to fly this caliber of airplane, and somebody has probably fed you full of a lot of stuff because, oh, yeah, it's stole equipped. That means you can pack it full of people, and it'll get off the ground in a heartbeat, and yada, yada, yada. Guess what? That's just a lack of total respect for aviation to even think that you are going to be able to fly an airplane of that caliber 500 pounds over and five inches out of the FCG. That's just, that's just unfathomable. And this is a, this is an accident that had the accident report fairly short, but very, very uh, full of information. And there's ancillary information. And I referenced earlier a newspaper article. It gives a little bit more background as what was going on. It says that uh, this was one of two planes rented by um, the company. But let me get this straight. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, one of two aircraft leased by the last day's ministry, which was the ministry that uh, Keith Green was 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 in, 
was used by Green for concert tours. So this was an aircraft that was used to promote the, the message of their, their organization and also to do concerts. And again, he was a Christian music uh, superstar, apparently. And this was a, uh, a sightseeing trip. This isn't even a trip where there was like a lot of planning involved. It's like, oh, let's just go out and look at this property over here. And uh, this was an airport, not a regular airport, not a towered airport, uh, not a regular, uh, uh, you know, private airport. This is like 2,000 foot uh, hard strip uh, runway, not much in the way of uh, resources there. So, you know, this is a situation where even if this was a survivable crash, there might not have been anybody there, any fire trucks, any anything to help them. save the people who were on the aircraft. No, it's, it's tragic. But I think the, the good thing about this particular report that we're talking about is this is the way the NTSB reports of today should look, where the investigator takes the time to dissect all the, the, the causal components of the accident and list them out. Let the reader draw their conclusion based on all of this, which is very easy to do in the format that it's in. But we've got to get away from loss of control for unknown reason, engine failure because a mechanic forgot to tighten the B-nut and get down to why did that mechanic forget to tighten the B-nut? Why did that pilot lose control of the aircraft? Because there are always underlying factors. And in the business that I'm in and John's in, where, you know, I, if I can figure it out two and three years after the NTSB has finished their report, why couldn't the NTSB figure it out when they had the best available evidence at the time? All right, so again, a maintenance involved accident. You mentioned them. And the B nut, which you just mentioned, and we mentioned in a previous show, the NTSB stops at the hangar doors. Mechanic made a mistake, B nut screwed up, and they didn't go into the detail that we go in when pilots make mistakes. I, and I've been I've been commenting about that and fighting for that for Jesus 30 years. And uh, it, uh, we're still there. We're still there. I, it seems like that's going to be one of those things that never get changed. But they never give enough uh, analysis power to the maintenance investigation to ferret out those facts. So admittedly, you know, performing in these investigations, 800, you know, 600, 700 GA accidents a year, I mean, it's a challenge. And that's why they don't travel to most of them. Uh, but they, they, need to, they need to do a better job of identifying that they didn't travel. I mean, I'm glad they started putting that on the report and, and leaving things open for further work in the event that they do it, just so it's clear to the to the people out there, all of us out there, that these reports are very limited in nature. I mean, we used to, they used to call them limited reports many years ago. Somewhere along the line, we stopped talking about that. Yeah. Well, and, and the fact is, John, you and I are working an accident. I'm working other accidents with other experts where the board has failed. Not they didn't, but they failed to accept the reality of the factual information that was out there, the factual evidence. And we've presented that evidence to the NTSB only to be told basically pound sand, we've already made this determination and we're not changing it. When what they wrote in their report and their probable cause is not supported in any way, shape, or form by the storyline or the facts. And that is a disservice to aviation and to the families because they are the, they are the responsible organization who is supposed to ferret out all those facts, come to a very logical probable cause for the interest of enhancing aviation safety. And Every week, we dissect accidents and we find the fatal flaws in their reports. And with all these open-ended questions that, that were never answered and probable causes are very vanilla and safety is not enhanced by any of these bottom lines. And it's just very frustrating. 
because every week we keep finding these accidents. We don't have to look very hard. And in some cases, even our listeners are sending us accidents going, hey, you really should look at this one. This one just happened and look how bad it is. And, but I'm glad that we talked about this uh, Keith Green accident because this is old school, 1982. That's old school. That's when investigators really got down in the dirt, thorough and methodical, and they presented that information as you see it in this particular report. You know, over the, the last 15 and maybe even 20 years, the NTSB has lost a lot of experience. And those, those experienced personnel were the mentors for all the new guys coming in. And we've actually seen in that same period of time, those new guys that came in in the, in the let's call it the 2000 to 2010 window, they're already gone. And now they were weak because of poor mentorship. And they were the ones that mentored the group that's there now. Yeah. So we've had a loss, serious loss of experience at the NTSB. Well, I wrote, to, well you know, I'm sorry. They need to come back to basics. Yeah. Well, you know, you were there when I left. I wrote a mentor program before I walked out the door, only to be told, yeah, thanks for your interest in aviation safety, pound sand, get out. And I mean, because I could see this coming because I was blessed when I went to work for the board that I had some of the best mentors in board's history who were my my silent mentors, my tutors. Um, I learned a lot from them. And it was all about trying to pass that corporate knowledge on to the next generation. But we lost a lot of good people who walked out the door with a lot of that knowledge because nobody wanted it, not at the agency. And now we have what we have. And, you know, you, you, you don't know what you don't know. And you have people that don't know what they don't know, teaching people they don't know what they don't know. And it's just, it, it's, it's bad um, because there, there is no substance. They're turning out numbers. They can pull up statistics, but they mean nothing without the substance of, okay, why was there a loss of control? I know there was a loss of control. That's what caused the act. But why was there a loss of control? Why did this mechanic not tighten that B nut? That's the good stuff. Yeah, and it's the simple stuff too. Yeah. And Todd, you see, I mean, you research these, you know, for the for the show. And you get to read, you know, some of the backstory stuff or whatever. And there's some good stuff that you pulled up. It's like, well, why isn't that in the report? And uh, I don't know if it's a not invented here syndrome or what, but again, we're also fortunate in this age in that uh, we have this internet thing where we can sometimes pull some real gems out of the ether, which would have been impossible 20 years ago. It's like, you know, it took me, what, 30 seconds to find a 42-year-old news article that actually had some nuggets of information that was useful for us and took me even less to uh, put together other pieces for this. And again, this is something that's not just for us here at the Flight Safety Detectives, not even for folks who are professional investigators, anyone who has an interest in finding out about why things happen, finding out about how to keep it from happening to them, you know, go out there and look for stuff, ask your own questions. They might be even much better than the questions we're asking ourselves here. Well, that, I like that summary because that was your second to the last word. That was my second to the last word. That was pretty good, Todd. Nice segue. So, John, we're going to just let it rip with you. Okay. So, as usual, if you're going to go flying, do a adequate pre-planning pre session. Do it in your hotel or your house before you leave. Redo it again at the airport to verify that nothing has changed. When you go out to your airplane... Do a good pre-flight. If you don't think you're doing a good pre-flight or you want to make sure you are, grab a mechanic that works on the airplane, ask him to tell you the points that you should be looking at. And after you get in the airplane and, and that fly, put your head on a swivel because we're still in having near misses and mid-air collisions. A lot of people flying, a lot of inexperienced people flying. So pay attention out there. And please, please fly safely. 
Thank you for checking out our show. We really value our listeners and subscribers. Our podcast gets ranked by you and how much you like it. So please give us five stars in your podcast platform. We want to keep in contact with you. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and of course, YouTube. You can email the show at flightsafetydetectives at gmail.com. By the way, if you're on YouTube, we're really working on growing the channel, and it helps if you all send in comments. Please do that. And we read all the comments. And be sure to subscribe. Remember, if you're in the market for aviation insurance, you can save 5% with Avemco just by mentioning our show. Visit them at www.avemco.com. That's it for this episode of the Flight Safety Detective. Until the next episode, fly safe.